The Cell. You've already learned about it. It's an amazing place, chock full of tons of fun organelles that do all sorts of different things, and you are made up of 75 trillion cells. Well, you've already learned about the structure of the plasma membrane, and we're going to review that real quick. But what this lecture is about is cell transport. That is, how do you get molecules inside and outside of the cell? How do you cross that plasma membrane? Now, you might recall that a plasma membrane is not a boring place. It's chock full of proteins, there's cholesterols, and things sticking out of the cell, kind of like, like this, right? And it's not boring like this, it's more like Hello Kitty like this. So it's a cool place, lots of stuff happening. And all the stuff is happening in your cells right now. You're getting all sorts of things crossing that plasma membrane. So if you look at this picture, it kind of gives sort of an artist's interpretation of cell membranes. So here's your phospholipid bilayer. And remember the polar heads on each side and the nonpolar fatty acid chains on the inside. And there's proteins embedded all through this, this cell membrane. And that helps to allow larger molecules to pass right through. Large molecules that otherwise wouldn't be able to cross the cell membrane. So we're going to find out exactly these methods that cells um, have for getting stuff inside and outside the membrane. So quick review of the plasma membrane. You've already learned it. Just remember it's a phospholipid bilayer, right? So it has two layers of phospholipids. And a phospholipid has a head. So each phospholipid has a head. And that head is made of glycerol, which is a polar molecule. And it has two fatty acid chains, one of which is kinked. And those are nonpolar. So here's a picture of a phospholipid. If I can get my cursor back, there it is. Here's kind of an artist's interpretation. So here's your polar glycerol molecule head and your two fatty acid chains. So here they are in kind of a bubble diagram here. So the fatty acid chains are just strings of carbon uh, with hydrogens attached. So here the black would be carbon and the blue would be hydrogens. And one of the fatty acid chains is kinked, and you might remember that's because Two carbon atoms joined together by a double bond kinks up that fatty acid chain. The other one is saturated with hydrogen, so it's single bonds between all the carbon atoms. And uh, you might remember that this interpretation of the plasma membrane is called the fluid mosaic model. Um, and there's cholesterols embedded into the nonpolar area in the middle. Um, there are proteins embedded all through the cell membrane, and these serve for um, allowing large molecules or molecules with certain charges to pass in and out of that membrane. So those are really important little things. They can kind of look like maybe like this. Some of them have um, chains of carbohydrates or glycoproteins, you know, glycolipids, all sorts of stuff sticking out of that membrane, kind of like that. So how do we get stuff across? And here's, you might recall, other pictures of what a cell membrane looks like. Just keep in mind, these are just two-dimensional little pieces of the cell membrane. The cell membrane is actually surrounding your entire cell. So most of our cells are spherical-ish looking. And so all of this would be that plasma membrane with little proteins embedded all over the place. Okay, so here are the four ways we're going to talk about um, getting molecules across that cell membrane. And if you look at this uh, diagram here, it kind of looks like if I went something like this, right, into my balloon. And that's one of the way you can, ways you can get stuff across. So we're going to be talking about the principles of diffusion and osmosis, active transport, passive transport, also called facilitated diffusion, and the way cells eat, which is called phagocytosis, and if stuff's coming into the cell, we call it endocytosis. If you're taking it out of the cell, we call that exocytosis. Okay, so let's get started on this. Let's first talk about the principles of diffusion and osmosis. So how many of you have seen the movie Open Water? That's what I thought. Good. If you haven't seen this movie, you have to not see this movie. It is horrible. But... That's not the point. The point is what happens at the end of the movie. And then, yes, there will be a spoiler. So this couple here are out on a boat. They go diving. The boat accidentally leaves them behind, and they're stuck in the middle of the open water. And to be a spoiler, the guy gets eaten by sharks, and the girl's left by herself. 
Now, that girl's out there for a long time, and at the end of the movie, she ends up dying. But if you look at her face, her lips are all dry, she's crying, but there's no tears coming out of her eyes. And you may stop and think, wait a minute, this lady is completely surrounded by water. Why is she dehydrating? Well, it's, duh, right? It's salt water. So it's salt water. You can't drink salt water. But if you ever asked yourself why, why can't you drink salt water? And why do you get dehydrated when you're stuck in the ocean? Well, it has to do with the principles of diffusion and osmosis. And so the principle of diffusion says that molecules go from an area of greater concentration to lesser concentration. They go from an area where they're highly concentrated to where they're less concentrated. So in the case of the ocean, the salt is more concentrated in the ocean, this area, the environment surrounding her cells, than it is concentrated inside of her cells. And so by the principle of diffusion, it wants to go from where it's more concentrated in the ocean to inside her cells where it's less concentrated. Well, because of that, as that, as those solutes, the salt comes in there, water is also going to do a diffusion of its own, and that diffusion is called osmosis. So the water wants to go from an area where it's greater concentrated to an area where it has less concentration. And so in this case, her cells started out having a higher concentration of water than the ocean outside of her cells. So the water goes from inside to outside, the salt goes from outside to inside, and her cells end up shriveling up. Total dehydration, bye-bye lady, end of movie. Okay, so this is the principles of diffusion and osmosis. And can you die from water? Why, yes, you can. And there's been several kind of gruesome incidences of where people have died from drinking too much fresh water, not salt water, fresh water. Uh, here's an example. Uh, this was back a few years ago. A U.S. woman dies of water intoxication. So there was actually a radio station contest in California. I think this was San Francisco or somewhere around there. And um, <coughs> they basically said, whoever can go on an all-water diet the longest without eating and without urinating will win a trip to Hawaii. Well, um, a woman won, and she went seven days with only drinking water and not eating, and she ended up dying. Water intoxication. Well, what happened to her? Why did she die from too much fresh water? Well, principles of osmosis and diffusion here, right? She's not eating, so she's not taking in solutes. No salts, no other kinds of molecules like that. And so when she's suddenly flooding her body with fresh water, now the water level or concentration in her blood and um, other fluids in her body is much more highly concentrated than the water inside of her cells. And therefore that water, by the principle of osmosis, wants to go from the area where it's more concentrated to where it's less concentrated, so it goes inside her cells. There's no solutes to balance it because she's not eating, and pretty soon the cells go bloop, bloop, and they explode. That's water intoxication. So yes, water can kill you by the principles of osmosis. Okay, so this is to sum up diffusion. Kind of shows like what this picture shows right here. Imagine um, I had a bottle of perfume and I had a room full of people and I was standing at the front of the room. If I took the top off the bottle of perfume, who would smell it first? Well, I would, right? Because I'm right there. And so the, the perfume is highly concentrated inside the bottle. It's less concentrated outside the bottle, right? There's none until I take the top off. So that perfume molecules are going to want to go from inside the bottle to outside the bottle, and since I'm standing right there, I'm the first to, to smell it, but now they're more concentrated here than they are further down the room. So those molecules want to keep traveling down through the air to areas where they're less concentrated, and that will keep happening until the room is uniformly spaced with the perfume molecules. Kind of like this diagram here, where it's all concentrated here, and it's starting to spread out. Another way to think of this, if I took a glass of water, and I dropped one drop of red dye in it, you would slowly see that red dye start to spread out. It wants to go from areas where it's highly concentrated to areas where it's less concentrated, and that is called diffusion, and that would happen until the whole thing of water is uniformly red. So definition time. Diffusion, net movement of molecules down a concentration gradient towards areas of lower concentration. Concentration gradient? What in the world is that? 
Okay, so all that means is if there's a difference in concentration between two areas. So if it's highly concentrated here and less concentrated there, there's a difference. Therefore, that is a concentration gradient. So in diffusion, molecules go down their concentration gradient. They go from an area of, uh, where they're highly concentrated to an area where they're less concentrated. Okay, so here's a formal definition for concentration gradient. Concentration of ions or molecules on either side, um, not the same as the other. Okay, and different things can affect the rates of diffusion. So molecules tend to move a lot faster when temperatures are high. And when they're moving a lot faster, there's a greater chance that they're going to happen to go to the areas where they're less concentrated. And so if you raise the temperature, diffusion happens faster. Size makes a difference. So small molecules can go through concentration gradients faster because they're smaller. They can slip on through anywhere they get the opportunity to do so. And electrical gradients. So um, if molecules are charged and that charge is the opposite of where they want to go, they're going to move down that concentration gradient faster. Here's a diagram kind of showing what I was talking about. Um, so instead of a drop of red dye, they're using a red sugar cube here. And you can just see how the molecules of the sugar will start dispersing out into the rest of the water because they're highly concentrated in the sugar cube, not concentrated in the water. And so they'll keep moving until you get a uniform distribution of sugar molecules. Cool, huh? And you might be thinking, why am I learning all this? Why do I care about diffusion and osmosis? This is the way everything happens in our body. This principle is so important for every system in the body. The way the kidneys function, the way the heart functions, the way nerve impulses go through your neurons. It's all based on these principles. And again, osmosis is just diffusion of water. It's a fancy name for diffusion, but it's because you're talking about water, so it gets its own name, osmosis. But it's diffusion of water across the cell membrane. And so this is where you're going from areas of high concentration of water to areas of low concentration of water. Okay, and water is a small enough molecule that it just can pass freely across the cell membrane. It doesn't need any helpers. It just goes in and out, in and out um, with its concentration gradient, so with um, osmosis. So area, uh, water travels to an area of less water. Okay, good enough, right? Understand diffusion osmosis. Osmosis is just diffusion of water. Diffusion just means things going down their concentration gradient from areas of greater concentration to lesser concentration. So an osmotic concentration is the concentration of all molecules dissolved in a solution. In other words, um, basically everything that's a solute gets dissolved Osmotic concentration is how those differences are between the water and the solutes. So um, here is a picture of the poor lady cells in open water where they've become completely dehydrated because the salt has moved in and the water has moved out. And so that means that her cells, her body, were placed into a hypertonic solution. In other words, a very salty solution, and a solution, in this case seawater, where, the solu where there was a higher concentration of solutes in the outside environment, the water, than there was inside her cells. And so when you're placed in a hypertonic solution, you get shriveled up cells because those salts move into the cells. And the case of the lady on the radio station where she drank too much water, um, in that case she was creating in her body a hypotonic solution, too much water outside of her cells. Um, so hypotonic solution, solution with low concentration of solutes or high concentration of water. And so by the principle of osmosis, the water wants to go from outside her cells to inside her cells, and therefore her cells actually blow up like balloons and eventually explode. What we're shooting for is nice, happy, donut-shaped red blood cells here. So these are all red blood cells. So we want our red blood cells to look like this. That means that they're in an isotonic solution, a solution where there's an equal concentration of solutes and water inside and outside the cell. That makes us happy. No diffusion osmosis going on. Status quo, cells are happy. Okay, so that was diffusion and osmosis. Now, sometimes things need a little help crossing the plasma membrane. It's not enough to just have a concentration gradient. This happens when, for example, molecules are too large, like proteins and things like that, 
are too large to just cross that phospholipid bilayer on their own. They need help. And so they need the help of what are called protein channels or protein carrier molecules. These are those proteins that we saw embedded into the phospholipid bilayer. So again, you can think of it as this little thing right here. This might be a channel protein that's going to help a big molecule like this to go through. So it can go through that channel protein to get inside the cell or vice versa to get outside the cell. So it's like diffusion because the molecules trying to get in or out are still going through a concentration gradient. They're still wanting to go from areas where they are more highly concentrated to areas where they're less concentrated. But because so, they're so big, they need the help of a protein. And so uh, this is kind of illustrating that. So here's a channel protein. Here's a particular molecule we're trying to get across the cell membrane. And you'll notice that it's more highly concentrated outside the cell here than inside the cell. Right? There's less, less molecules here than there is here. But because they're large, these guys are going to need the help of these channel proteins. So the channel proteins um, bend. They're made of amino acids, so they just kind of change shape. And that will help these guys to pass right through. The smaller molecules don't need that facilitated diffusion or passive transport. They just go right through the membrane. OK, so this is called passive transport or facilitated diffusion because it's facilitating a diffusion process that would occur on its own if the molecule was smaller. So because of all this, we say that our cell membranes are selectively permeable. Selectively permeable, that means they're permeable, things can cross the cell membrane, but they're selective because large things can't cross without a, help, a certain protein helping them. And so if that protein's not there, that substance doesn't cross. So for example, this is a way our cell could keep out unwanted bacteria or toxins or things like that because it has certain proteins that bind to the good stuff and it tries to not bind to the bad stuff, although sometimes the bad stuff mimics our natural things that, that our body does want. Okay, so our cells can control what comes in and out of them, and that's why they're selectively permeable. Um, so, again, just keep in mind that passive transport, you're still involving diffusion in osmosis. You're still, or diffusion specifically, you're still involving molecules going from an area of greater concentration to lesser concentration. It's just they have the help of a channel protein. But the take-home message here is this is a natural process that requires no energy. No ATP is needed for passive transport to occur. Things go down their concentration gradient naturally. They just use a channel protein to help them out. We're going to contrast that with what's called active transport. Active transport is when you're taking stuff the opposite the way. Instead of going from higher to lower, you're going from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration. You're forcing something against the way it naturally wants to go. And that's why we need the help of energy for this one. That energy is going to come in the form of ATP. So when ATP is there, we can help stuff go from against the way it naturally would. It goes against the concentration gradient. So this is a one-way energy requiring process going against the concentration gradient um, and so here's a, a diagram kind of showing you. So here are these molecules are less concentrated here than they are over here. So normally by diffusion on its own, things would want to go from here that way up. But because we need them to go the opposite way, we're going to add an energy in the form of ATP and force these guys to go from an area of lower concentration to higher concentration. So it's the opposite of passive transport. It's active transport and it requires energy in the form of ATP. So these guys that use this process are so important to all the functions in our body. Here are some common um, areas where you see this happening. Sodium potassium pumps, proton pumps, calcium pumps. Let me just give you the example of sodium potassium pump. You have sodium potassium pumps and what all these are, are these protein channels that are embedded in the cell membranes and they pump sodium and potassium out against their concentration gradient using ATP. So these sodium potassium pumps are embedded in the membrane, for example, of our motor neurons, which allows us to get impulses from our brain or spinal cord uh, down to our muscles so that we can contract our muscles. And it's all the way the sodium and the potassium go back and forth. It's 
truly an amazing process. If you get into this and you decide to, for example, take anatomy physiology, you'll get into all the molecular stuff going on with these pumps. But it's all based on these basic principles of diffusion, osmosis, passive and active transport. Um, and so basically every time um, ATP is broken, you break the bonds, because remember this is adenosine triphosphate, you have three phosphate molecules. When you break the bonds and take one of the phosphates off, you get ADP, adenosine diphosphate, plus another phosphate. That breakage of the bonds is releasing the energy. So that's what fuels active transport. Now, what is that energy that we just released from breaking the bonds of ATP? Well, that's a metaphysical question. Nobody really knows what that is, but we just know that it is, and it's a force, and when you break the ATP, it releases that energy, and that's what fuels all the things in our body. Okay, so um, here's an example of a proton pump. In this case, proton means hydrogen ion, uh, since it just has a charge of one, they call it a proton. But in this case, um, you can see that the hydrogen is more highly concentrated outside the cell than inside, but if for whatever reason we needed to get that hydrogen to go from an area where it's less concentrated here to an area where it's more concentrated here, we're going to need the help of a channel protein called a, a proton pump, but because we're going against the concentration gradient, we need ATP to fuel it. Okay, so we've been over diffusion, osmosis, passive transport, active transport. Now, sometimes you have a completely different process to get stuff inside and outside a cell. So, for example, some of your immune cells are called phagocytes. Um, so, for example, macrophages are phagocytes. Phag means um, to eat, P-H-A-G, phag-O, and that means to eat. So think of Pac-Man, chomp, 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 chomp. That's kind of what these cells do. They basically come along. Imagine here's a lonely little bacterial cell here, and here's my macrophage. He's going to phagocytize or undergo phagocytosis. He's going to come along and basically chomp and take him inside and eat him. That's kind of how it happens. But here's an example, a little more detail of what's going on here. So imagine here's your bacterial cell. Here is your phagocytizing cell, like a macrophage. Basically what happens is the cell comes, he binds to the bacterial cell, and his plasma membrane actually starts to wrap around that bacterial cell. So it's wrapping around and meeting on the other side. And because these are all phospholipids, they can kind of just merge with each other. And you end up producing a little bubble here called a vesicle that contains the bacterial cell. And then the, uh, the macrophages um, vesicles will start secreting um, enzymes that will help to digest and break down this guy. And eventually he will almost disintegrate and that's called lysis, he will lyse. Okay, so phagocytosis, the vesicle contains some sort of food as in this bacterial cell. Penocytosis, it's the same idea, except that it'll be liquid instead of a solid. Um, so that is called endocytosis, where you're taking something inside. Endo means inside, so and cyto means cell. So this is taking something inside the cell. So it's endocytosis, but the actual act of eating it is called phagocytosis. Now, sometimes you want to take stuff that's inside the cell and get it outside of the cell. That's called exocytosis. Think of exiting, right? Exo means outside. So this is expulsion from the cell. Um, and so in this case, um, whatever you're trying to get rid of, this might be broken down waste products, toxins, things like that. Um, or it could be trying to transport needed proteins to other areas. So imagine this is whatever it is you're trying to get outside your cell. It's been packaged in a nice vesicle. And the membrane around the vesicle is also a phospholipid bilayer. So as it migrates to the edge of the cell, because it's made of the same stuff, it merges with the plasma membrane of the cell, and that causes part of it to open up, and out it goes. Um, sometimes it's not waste products. So, for example, um, the way you contract your muscles. Um, so you have neurons from your brain or from your spinal cord um, that send signals to other neurons that are attached almost attached to your muscle cells. And so there's a little space in there, but at the end of that neuron, the way it's gonna tell your muscle to actually move is it is through the process of exocytosis. It's gonna have chemicals in here like acetylcholine and it'll 
basically dump those contents, those chemicals, out into a little space between the neuron and the muscle cell, and that will eventually cause the muscle cell to contract through a series of steps that if you want to learn about, take an AMP. So anyway, um, that's exocytosis. You're just trying to get stuff outside of the cell. And here's a photograph showing how that process happens. So here's your vesicle. Here's what you're trying to get outside of the cell. The vesicle's merging with the plasma membrane, and out it dumps. Okay, there you go. Diffusion osmosis, passive transport, also called facilitated diffusion. Active transport, which requires ATP because you're going against the concentration gradient. And endocytosis, which includes um, phagocytosis and pinocytosis, and exocytosis. Hope this helps, and uh, I'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye.